Kia ora everybody. Um, I'm lucky enough to be sitting here with Kai. I can't even know how to pronounce your last name. Furnu? Furno? Well, it's not Furnoex, but you got it very close. Furno. <laughs> Furno. And I was super lucky that when I released the Pete Evans podcast, um, good friend Adam Kavner, who we had on the podcast, showed it to this um, inspiring woman, basically. And she got in contact and said that was cool. So it's really great to meet and talk with you, Kai. Um, I don't know how many of the podcasts you've listened to yet, but we always start off with what did you do on the weekend? What did I do last weekend? Um, my life has been so all over the place at the moment. Um, but I did take my niece camping for the first time. So she is six years old. And her parents are more um, business oriented parents. So I've been trying for two years to get my uh, niece out camping and I had to do baby steps. The first time I took her camping, I was only allowed to take her in camping in the living room. So, you know, I had to set up the tent in the living room and I'm like an outdoor guide for 10 years. Like, this is what I do. <laughs> my sister and her husband wouldn't let, me, uh, wouldn't let me go any further than that until this weekend. So I uh, took her out on Friday night and we had a hundred kilometer gale force winds and hail and she rode it out like a champion and uh, yeah, slept through the whole thing. And so we had a fantastic first time camping. That's really cool. Did I see a, a girl guide sash or was, was that somebody different? <laughs> um, I have done some girl guide sessions, but <laughs> my niece isn't girl guides yet. I hope she, I hope she gets there someday. But I, I did a, um, a session with the girl guides up in Brisbane where I took them rock climbing. Oh, love rock climbing. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's something my partner and I are hoping to get back into is, is the rock climbing. What, what was the camping environment for your niece now she's out in the wilderness with you? Oh, you know, I wish it was wilderness, but again, it was baby steps. So I took her to Lawn, which is like a little town just down the road. And I was allowed to take her in a caravan park there. So I was a little bit busier, but you know, we put up the tent and she was fantastic. Um, where there was these water rats just next to where our tent was. And, and, and I'm always like trying to get people excited about um, the environment and, and stuff and so she was like it's a water rat and, and they were eating garbage so she got a plastic bag and cleaned up the whole campsite with like collect, like a six-year-old it's just like we're cleaning up the garbage because you know Dora the Explorer does it so she was out cleaning up and uh, and then we fed the water rats carrots and broccoli instead of garbage so it was <laughs> you know it still had a lot of wildlife we had the sulfur crested cockatoos and some ducks come in and you know, it, it was enough wilderness that she sort of got to play in the outdoors a little bit, but not too much that, you know, she was frightened by the, the silence around. I'll have to build up to that. So that's awesome. And hopefully it inspires a few more parents to take their kids camping. I'm super lucky. My whole life I've been camping right on the edge of a lake. Because yeah. Swimming in a lake at three months old. So, yeah, love camping. That's super cool. <laughs> How about yourself? I, yeah, I think it's really important. Like my... Mum and dad took us camping when we were quite young and so it was something we were introduced to and you know some of my favorite times were when um you know my dad would wake us up in the morning with a hot cup of you know cup of hot chocolate and he would have put like the bacon and eggs on the camp stove outside and so I had some really fond memories of of camping myself and um you know I think that what people get so fearful about the camping experience but you know if you have a car and you have the right equipment you can make it just super comfortable for anyone i mean we had a, a mattress and we had feather pillows and you know blankets and glow sticks lining the tent roof and you know there's there's something that people feel that camping has to be uncomfortable and camping has to be something that you tough it through but i think you know it's really important to show kids that it's you know one of the funnest things to do and and quite an adventure more so than something to be you know overcome or an adversity to fight against you know absolutely and even even hunters are taking um ear mattresses out with them just so they can get a good good night's sleep and doesn't have to weigh much you know it doesn't have to take take up much room but yeah, yeah. you never want to skip on a good night's sleep and, and absolutely <laughs> yeah i mean i'm not i could take it or leave it like that's what i always laugh at you know like I can go out with a pocket knife and sleep in the dirt and, you know, same, same to me, you know, but I also understand that, you know, people just aren't used to that kind of roughing it and living that lifestyle. So, 
my main aim is to make people enjoy the wilderness. And if that means I have to take a feather pillow and a, and a comforter out with you, I will do that. You know, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of my active friends when I was in um, Los Angeles, they were all so terrified about going camping and I'd take them out and I'd have the, the chairs and the bottles of wine and cook them a deluxe meal on the campfire and make sure they had the thick air mattresses. And, and you know, they actually walked away from it loving the wilderness experience. And, you know, I think it, that's the most important thing out of it. Right, so what's uh, more scary, if you will, mountain lions and coyotes or crocodiles and, skate and snakes? <laughs> oh, geez, you know, like... Definitely not coyotes and definitely not snakes. So I would, <laughs> I mean, and I would love to see mountain lions and I'm not too worried about crocodiles. I mean, I wouldn't jump in and swim with them just yet. Um, I have a mate who did a uh, documentary called Dancing with Dragons, I think it was called, and he swam with saltwater crocodiles, like got up so close to them. So I also have a belief that with the right sort of um, moments and moods and energy, you could probably swim with the salties but you know out of those four animals i'd probably leave the saltwater crocs alone nice okay so australia woods <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i mean only because i haven't come face to face with a mountain lion but i'm pretty sure if i did i'd probably be so excited that i'd scare it away <laughs> he, he's he's hoping it had, had, a, had a good job uh, could feed of mountain sheep or something <laughs> yeah exactly you see with those things i think you're actually really lucky if you get to see them you know like people are always saying to me oh i'd hate to go to australia and you've got all those snakes and to me it's so rare to actually see them in the wilderness that it's actually an honor and you're actually really lucky if you do get to interact with the snakes you know rather than rather than it be something to be feared of. nice i'll uh, keep that in mind for when we hit it hit over there uh, yeah I think I think the huntsman spiders are going to get the biggest squeal out of my partner, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll stay away from this. <laughs> <laughs> but the huntsmen they don't bite, so I mean they do, but it's more like just like a bee stingy thing. Like you're fine with them. It's just they've got all these legs and they like really run erratically. So once you get over that, you'll be fine. I think I think I'll be fine. I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, if you live in Ballina, you can call me up. I'll come get them out of your house. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so who is Kai? Because um, before you contact me, I hadn't heard of you. And, and then I was so <laughs> <back. What? laughs> oh, Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then I, with one click, I was like, wow. Um, who is Kai? <laughs> uh, well, definitely not as famous as you might have thought I was. <laughs> um you know, that's the, the funny thing to me is like you go on this amazing journey and you have all these incredible experiences and, and you know, perhaps it gets written up in the press and perhaps you achieve something with your life and at your heart of hearts, like I me mean, for me, at my heart of hearts, I'm always just that little dorky outdoor kid that was, you know, happiest wandering around barefoot in the bush, you know. So um, I, I'm like a comic book nerd. I, you know, I, it's always surprising to people when they see that, you know, I think they assume being a stunt performer, I'm going to be like tough and be just trying to beat everybody up all the time. And, um, I've never been that, um, I've always believed it's, you know, it's cool to have a balance of everything in my life. And, um, yeah, so I'd say I'm just an outdoor geek who, whose brain worked best on a level with nature facts rather than mathematics or <laughs> or um, accountancy. Accountancy. So uh, that probably leads us into the story that got you to, to being a stump person and, and a good one at that. Um, you were studying and then you had a, a car accident. Do you want to walk us through the timeline and, and, and the experience of, of both of those? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think the other thing that people assume about me is I was always athletic and that I always was an achiever, but I never was. You know, like I, I was that kid at school that um, barely scraped through. So mum and dad had to pull all their resources together. They weren't wealthy and they sent me to a private school because they thought that that was the only way I was actually going to pass my matric. Um, so I wasn't, you know, it was like one of those things. My sister was very smart and they were like, yeah, Kai's got a bit of personality, yay. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> that was sort of how I wandered through life. I was, I was definitely active and I was in the outdoors. Um, so mum really worried about what I was going to do after school. And she enrolled me in a Bachelor of Business Management because my sister had, um, had done that course. And I got enough grades barely to get in to start that at um, TAFE, which is like a technical and further education college. And um, started, started studying the Bachelor of Business Management. I was about 19 and I was going down a freeway uh, on a date one night and I was in a car that, with a guy that sought a lot of his car, I guess, <laughs> and somebody passed him on the freeway and he didn't even know who they were and he got a bit upset about them passing and so then sped up to pass them and the race was on. And it was peak hour on a Friday night down the freeway and they're racing along and there's this um, bend in the Adelaide freeway called the Devil's Elbow. Went around the devil's elbow too fast, spun out and missed every single other car, thank goodness, um, in peak hour. Spun around and then went at about 80k an hour into a Stobie pole. Um, and I had been reading a Reader's Digest article the, the week before that said most of the problems in car accidents is head injuries. So as my head flew towards the dash, everything slowed down and I managed to put my hand up and like took the impact on my my forearm instead of my head which to this day I'm so thankful for because I had a massive sort of welty bruise on my forearm which would have probably smashed my head in and um, I heard a crack and I'd also read in this article about breaking backs in car accidents and um, I realized that's probably what I'd done and so the car was almost split in two and the engine was on runners. So the engine had been forced under the car. Otherwise we both would have been dead. And the guy that was in the car was just like, ah, my car. And he like gets out and he's all upset about the car and there's petrol going everywhere and everyone's screaming and all the traffic stopped. And, and I'm just sitting there in the car and people are like opening the door, get out of the car. It's going to blow. And, and I, um, and I was just, like very calm about the whole thing. I was just sort of said, you know what? I, I think I've done something to my back. I'm just going to stay in the car and nobody moved me. And, and just sort of that was, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I believe that I'd broken my back and, but I, I'd sort of felt like something go, um, and got taken to the hospital. Even the nurses were like, ah, oh, she hasn't really done anything. Cause if she'd broken her back, she, she'd be making a lot more of a fuss. And they moved me like, you're not meant to move a back patient. So they moved me to take my clothes off and everything. But the x-rays came out and the doctor, I remember the moment he told me, um, and he came over to the bedside and mum and dad were there. And he said, well, um, you know, you've broken your back, but it's, it's in a good place to break your back. <laughs> And I just remember thinking, okay, well, you know, lucky me. <laughs> I've done it in the best place to break my back. And I didn't know what that meant. And I asked him what that meant. And he said, well, you'll not be able to be physically active again for the rest of your life. Like you, you know, he said, you play sport. And I said, yeah, I play tennis. And he said, well, that, you won't be playing tennis again. Um, and it was so melodramatic almost but I remember just like this tear just one tear and it just rolled down one eye and then I was like nah I was like no way is that going to be the rest of my life and it literally like was a switch like instantly in me um and you know we have this really cute picture of me as a kid where I would have thought oh if the mum and dad were like that's how you went through life if someone said to you no you'd be like I'll show you and the, the chin would come out and I'd be like Wah! and I think that was just a bit inbuilt in my nature so the fact that he told me no and his prognosis was so different to how I wanted to live my life I just sort of was like nah um, I finished my Bachelor of Business Management I did my final exams lying on my back with like a tray over the top of me so I could write everything and um, yeah I was indoors for a good, oh, like a good six months and had a back brace. And, you know, these days I don't think they even keep you still for that type of injury. But back then they're sort of, you know, they really are very care were very careful with it. <clears throat> and, yeah, 
the, a long time indoors and then I decided that the being a marketing manager of a major hotel chain where I'd be sitting inside for most of my life was just not the life I wanted. Yeah, that's understandable. But um, when, when the doctor presents a prognosis to you, do they go into why they thought that physical activity was not, not going to be the thing to do? And, and you say that even now um, back therapy is so much more physical and, and it's mobile and it's, it's about supporting that structure again. Um, yeah. Was it just a blanket statement and um, I'll leave you there to deal with it? <laughs> yeah. Like it was just that. It was just the worst possible case scenario dumped in my lap. And, you know, that that's one of the reasons I talk to people like you is because um, I've met a lot of people who've had exactly the same injury and they've listened to the doctor and their back has been problematic for their entire lives and they have fulfilled that prophecy you know and they haven't they've been uncomfortable and they've you know they've they've walked through life listening to the doctor and not listening to their own bodies and if you know if there's one person out there that has that diagnosis or has a diagnosis but it doesn't fit right for what they know on the inside and they hear this and and listen to themselves rather than the doctor and and lead a more um positive proactive life as a result then you know then i've succeeded <laughs> yeah and, and obviously you've got to be we've got to be careful that when we talk about a back injury that, that that could be anatomical but the amount of people that come in with sore backs and are, are on them you know ridiculous amounts of painkillers every day and um I don't, I don't know how well this has been publicized and probably needs to be on headline news and and every single newspaper but the key treatment for back so soreness back pain is not painkillers and they make it worse that it's actually psychology and i guess like you just touched on that not accepting that diagnosis and, and being in touch with who you are and how you feel and then mobility so yeah and and you can't listen to your body when you're doping it with painkillers you know, like part of what I did was I learned really quickly to discern between good pain and bad pain. Mm -hmm. So quite often in life, we wander through and we feel pain and we stop. But there's a good pain. Like we go to the gym and we work out and the next day we're a bit sore. I mean, that's a good pain. But some people will go to the gym, work out really hard, be in pain and be like, oh, the gym's not really working for me because, you know, I just really hurt. And I'm sure I've hurt myself, you know. So I think it's, the way I did it and the way I recommend to people is like, yes, listen to what your doctor says, but then also listen to you. And there's so many different um, incidences and, and things that could have happened to a human body and everybody's body responds differently to anything else. You know, like I don't think there's one right fix, which is why I think it's really important that you listen to yourself. Um, and that's what I did. Like I knew what good pain was. I knew the pain when I'd pushed myself, but not too far. And then I learned to recognize the bad pain when I'd gone too far and done some damage. And so, you know, I backed off on the bad pain and I pushed through the good pain and listened to my body. But you can't do that when you're full on on painkillers, you know. You, you can push it too far or you just don't push it far enough and, and it really mutes what's going on with you. Yeah, mutes and, and, and numbs your reaction. Um, at the time, do you... Do you know what you were what you were feeling, and then now look? I guess it's still looking back, but how do you feel about the situation now? It was the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, like there's definitely probably three big moments in my life where I've been I felt like the world crashed in and it sucked the worst it's ever sucked. And but at the end of the day, those were the, the also the moments that brought the biggest change in my life and took me off the track that I probably wasn't meant to be on and put me on a far more interesting track. Um, so I was really fortunate that my parents um, didn't let me watch TV uh, when I was flat on my back and mum brought me art supplies and I crocheted a rug and, uh, you know, so I, I painted and, and did art and crosswords and, 
and um, kept myself busy and, and active that way. And I, mum didn't let me feel sorry for myself ever. You know, I probably didn't cry through the whole thing. And it's really hard at 19 because suddenly, you know, mum took long service leave. They're both teachers. Mum took her long service leave. Dad look, he, took his long service leave. You know, you're 19 years old and your dad's pulling your pants down so you can go to the toilet, you know. There's, it, it's the most humbling experience that you can have, just being stripped back and not being able to do anything for yourself at such a, an age that independence is, is a really big thing. Um, so looking, I mean, even going through it, I don't think I was like, why me? You know, <laughs> but I definitely couldn't imagine my life any other way. Like I probably would just, I would have just become a marketing manager of a hotel chain and it probably wouldn't have been a bad life, you know. I probably would have done extraordinary things, in, you know, in that too and been very driven. But this was the life I was meant to live and I wasn't listening to the signs. So I needed something that I couldn't ignore. Nice. Yeah. I'll feel you. We were chatting about you know what we do, and you said you you go travelling, um, but <laughs> do you think that's that's one of your channels is is travel and adventure? When you say that one of the jobs you would have done as a marketing manager would be be you know potentially managing hotels, and there sounds a bit of travel and adventure aspect to that. But do you think that you were applying we the lane you're in to the desire that you wanted to do and there were two sort of um, parallel lanes that were weren't quite fitting do you think and, and and maybe the universe chucked you into the other one yeah i mean i i i'd never even been on a plane at 19 yeah you know so i'm not sure i mean my idea of the marketing manager would have been in like the Bahamas and some glossy, you know, Hyatt chain or something like that. You know, I, def I, I definitely, I don't, I don't know. I couldn't say whether it would have been a, a, an interesting parallel lifestyle or not, but I, I think it probably wouldn't have been. I think, um, I think I just would have been a completely different person. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, how did how did you feel like as you just said you got two t teachers for parents and and I've got a teacher as a parent myself and <laughs> so you know my pain. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't want to pay, pay, but I know I know the the sort of unspoken expectation and you said you got enrolled in a in a course. The question that I've started asking a lot of my young patients is what are you passionate about and a lot of them don't have a passion in and their parents will often chip in and, and you hear people like Gary Vee talking about, you know, remove yourself from your parents' expectations. As a 19 year old, do you think it was something that was a good place to be without, without a, a direction or did you have a direction at, it, at that point in time? Um, I didn't have a direction and that's what I find. Um, you know, a lot of people say, Oh, have you always wanted to be a stunt performer? And I was like, like at 26, when someone suggested I should be one, I didn't even know there was such a thing as stunt performers, you know? So it, it wasn't something that I had a goal and dream of. And, you know, I maybe wanted to be a marine biologist at one stage or a vet because I liked animals, but I really didn't have direction. And um, I think that I still don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I mean, I... I, I do. I have goals and I have dreams and I have passions and I, and I have things that I'm, I'm making happen. But I think I've really let go of the idea of what should or shouldn't and, and how structured something should be. Um, and, you know, the first sort of part of your question was about having uh, parents as teachers and, and feeling like you need a direction and stuff. I was really fortunate that mum and dad have probably been the reason I could do what I did because, yes, there was always that undercurrent of, like, Wow, like my dad always jokes when he watches my stunts, he's like, and that's what a private school education gets you. <laughs> so, so there, was a, there was always perhaps this expectation that I would come back and do something businessy, but um, they've always been a believer and a fan of finding your own path in your own way. Um, I don't know, did your mum used to have like the book clubs and stuff where you could, you could get books and posters? Did, oh, sorry, was it your mum or your dad? 
is my dad, but yeah, we, at, at our school, we, we, um, I was lucky enough to go to a decile one, which is low socioeconomic school, and we managed to actually get free books, so it was, it was great. Nice. <laughs> well, we, we went to one of those in, so my early childhood was a school with 20 kids in it, like, it had 200 population in the town, my dad was the principal, my mum was the vice principal, dad taught, like, year seven to year three and mum taught year two and to kindergarten and so you know sort of same thing but they'd give you these motivational posters that always had sayings on them you know like the cat hanging on the branch with like just hold on you know or, like you can do it and um I always blame mum and dad because the the posters that I had on on my wall is like in, in every living thing is the spirit to be free <laughs> And, and the one with the cat saying, you know, like, you can do basically anything you want to do. You just got to believe it, you know. And um, the other one was, like, if you see someone without a smile, give them one of yours. So I think, you know, essentially I became a, a very happy person who believed that you could, you know, do anything that you wanted to do because of these motivational posters that I saw every morning. But, um, yeah, I mean, so my parents definitely have have supported me no matter what even without the structure and moving forward that's wicked so by the, by the time you were 26 you said someone suggested what about stunt work what was what was the journey in between um in terms of getting into the outdoors and leading people in a venture yeah so that was really cool i ended up working for a corporate um team building and leadership company called venture corporate recharge in adelaide and they were a small business and needed a marketing plan done and I needed to do a marketing plan for to finish off my Bachelor of Business Management and so I did it for free for them for six months I worked out their marketing and sort of did a big plan for them and in return they taught me how to be a rock climbing instructor a kayaking instructor a sailing instructor hiking instructor and um, I learned how to work with juvenile offenders and business people and and children in in the outdoors so they ran all sorts of different programs and that was my life for sort of five or six years was running outdoor programs and I became an outdoor instructor in a time when legislation just got passed in South Australia saying that for every girl that was on a trip there needed to be a female instructor present and there was probably only three of us in South Australia <laughs> so I worked like 360 days a year or whatever you know I was like it was like non-stop I, every, I could have booked every day like 20 times over just and I, I so that was part of the reason that I ended up switching careers because I think I sort of got burnt out and uh, I was work, I was in a tent more than I was in a bed and which was fine you know I, I didn't mind it but eventually it's sort of like I'd like to be a bit settled and I didn't have a clue what kind of career to move into from there, but I was on a school camp down on the Coorong, which is the stretch of a peninsula down in South Australia. And there was these massive sand dunes and I used to play these gladiator games and, um, you know, there'd be a couple at the top and everyone at the bottom would be like, gladiators, are you ready? And they're like, yeah, you know, you have to try and get to the top of the, of the sand dune. And I don't know, I was, doing a backflip or tumbling down and one of the kids on the school camp was like, man, you should be a stunt woman. And that was honestly the first time I'd ever heard of that career. Nice. Um, one thing just came up there. Did you ever get excited and, and enter Gladiators when it came back on? Or? <laughs> no, but I wish I had. I, <laughs> I was over in Los Angeles at that stage, but uh, man, that would have just been... And I'm not big enough, you know, like those Gladiators, they are amazonian like they are built yeah. i mean like this little puny thing next to me <laughs> I, I i i just think it, it'd be quite a stinger when you get a uh, tennis ball shot at you and it hits you in the, in the leg and you're trying to get through a get through a coliseum no it's yeah that, that was my childhood watching gladiators it, it, yeah. it was a cool show yeah um, no, i loved it too you, you said about working with uh, juvenile offenders what was the biggest thing you learned from that experience um, that change is very hard to enact. Um, mm -hmm. And you can take someone out of an environment and they can learn new behaviours, but it's not ever going to work if you put them back in that same environment. You know, like it's... Um, the 
yeah, that, that was a really big learning experience for me because I was out there like, yeah, you know, we're going to change the world and, and work with these kids. And um, we would show them love and we'd show them different ways of doing things and different behaviours to adopt. And then we would take them back and put them right back where we found them. And in 10 days, you could do incredible things with getting these kids to change on the inside and start to be open and start to develop in ways they'd never thought they needed, you know, that they could develop. And then, um, yeah, and we would do follow-ups with them and stuff. And I'd see these, these amazing kids open up with us and then just like fold back in on themselves. So um, I realised that you need to have lasting and continual um, contact to create change. And you also need to um, either change where they're going back to or give them the tools to change where they're going back to. And I do believe that, I do believe that, you know, they took something back with them that was positive, but, um, you know, it, it is a very hard system to change and it's a very hard um, situation to see and um, just put people back into. Yeah, uh, the inspiration for doing this podcast was, was from a podcast called Every Man Podcast and the person who runs that, Dan Doty, did similar work with young men in, in the States doing wilderness expeditions and he would uh, reiterate that. What do you think the wilderness offers somebody that is probably in a dark place? And, and that was one of the things that Adam sort of spoke about is that nature gives you back so much vitality. What did, what did, yeah. you, what did you see with those kids? Uh, what I find with nature is it allows you to exceed even your expect your own expectations of yourself, you know, with, especially with those kids, you know, it, um, in a course sense, as far as like running a course, um, the reason I love the outdoors is you get instant feedback to bad behavior. Um, and by bad behavior or like negative patterns and things like that, you know, if you, like we had kids that would chuck their packs over a cliff and we're not getting them. So, you know, you chuck, you chuck your pack over the cliff. We keep walking. You don't have any food or tent or clothing that night. You go back and get your pack first thing in the morning, you know, like you won't chuck it off a cliff again. So there's consequences and there's fee, you know, there's, um, you're too la lazy to cook. You get tired and don't have the energy to continue. Um, you don't, collect water when you should you go thirsty you know so nature is a brilliant teaching ground um, as far as those sort of things but then on the flip side of that you always believe you can't do it you know you can't climb that peak you can't make the 200 extra steps to camp there's no way you can possibly hike 10 k's today and at the end of the day you've hiked 10 k's you've gone up that peak you've made it to camp you know and so you've exceeded your own expectations of yourself and it allows for incredible victories and incredible pride and, and um, just knowing that you have something in you that you didn't realize you had. Um, so on a, on a level where you're looking at taking people on a course in nature, that's sort of the things I think is absolutely brilliant about it. And you cannot pretend to be anyone you're not out there for a very long period of time. You know, once, once you've been out there 24 hours, you know, you're cold, you're tired, especially if you're not used to it, and you cannot keep the masks up. So eventually the, the layers will just be peeling off and, and, you know, you get to then see who you really are and you get to show the world who you really are. And, you know, if you've got the right people with you, get some positive feedback about who you really are. Um, and so that's sort of the reasons I love taking those children into the outdoors um, and also adults and me personally um, nature just is where I come alive <laughs> you know I can be as sick as a dog and I'll be like I shouldn't really go on this hike and the second I've got my feet on the ground you know the 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 energy of being out there makes me better and makes me healthier makes me fitter makes me come alive you know it's a, it's interesting because I do corporate motivational speaking as well and I was speaking to a group of lawyers and insurance agents the other day and there's a Q&A at the end of it and this lady put up her hand and she's like, it just sounds like it's horrible. 
And I was like, what? She said, yeah, you know, like I would hate to be outdoors. It's like my worst nightmare. Why do you do it? And I just like, I looked at her and I said, well, you know, I'm sure there's something in your life that when you do it, it lights you up, you know, like you have this passion for it. And when you're doing it, you're energized and excited about it. And she nods. And I said, well, that's what the outdoors does to me. You know, like it's where I come alive and I'm happiest. Like you can be a kid out there. So you're out there and you're playing. And, you know, I know that sort of, Adam mentioned the chasing the animals and things like that, but that's what you do. You know, you chase animals and you play and you create and you problem solve and, and you're doing it all out in this fresh air where there's no boundaries, there's no limitations. You have to deal with everything in the absolute moment that it's happening rather than, um, rather than we're on our phones or we're putting things off or, you know, we're just not engaged. You cannot be not engaged once you're out there in the wilderness. No, it's, uh, it's definitely a strong teacher and I'm from the South Island, which is big country and you can, Love it. you can see where you're going. And then when I've moved up to the Waikato and, and going around the bush and end up going in circles, it's definitely a quick lesson to calm down, look at, look at directions, look at landmarks and look at where I'm going. And um, I might not get there straight away, but when you do get there straight away, it's uh, a small victory and you, and you forget about hunting. <laughs> animals it's more about survival it, it, it's great um yeah so, so how, how did how did you go from um adventure uh, uh taking adventure courses to learning stunts to hollywood uh, that, that that sounds far <laughs> too linear so what, what's the up and down of that um well basically once i got it in my head that i want to be a stunt performer um I went to Vancouver because there, it was called Hollywood North at the time. And I knew that as an outdoor guide, I was going into an industry that could be so brutal because, you know, being an outdoor guide, everyone pitches in, everyone helps out, everyone's very down to earth. And I knew that Hollywood was a bit glitz and glam for me. So I went to Vancouver um, and <laughs> just wandered around and asked anyone a lot. I chopped wood. I lived in a van down by a river in a little town outside Vancouver, um, a climbing town called Squamish. So I climbed, I ran a few hikes and I, um, anyone that would listen, I was like, I'm going to be a stunt performer. I'm a stunt performer. No clue what that meant. No clue. I, I thought I could just abseil and rock climb in movies and it would all be really cool and that would be what I would do you know had all these transferable skills and finally somebody um at the bar one night was like that guy over there is a is a stunt performer why don't you go and talk to him so I went over and I was like hi um can I buy you a beer and I heard you're a stunt performer can I pick your brain and he just looked me up and down he said do you want to be a stunt performer <laughs> he's like how old are you and I think I was like 26 or 27 and um he's like you're too old and I was like well if I'm not too like okay I hear you but what would I need to do and he said well what skills do you have and I said well rock climb and I have sail and he said no but like can you fight no are you a gymnast mm -mm. and he said well are you like the best in the world at anything? And I was like, nah. <laughs> and so he's like just shaking his head. And um, I, he said, look, here's the name of a guy. If you're really serious about this, this guy's a fight trainer and he lives in Vancouver. He runs sessions, fight sessions for stunt performers. And he said, you can uh, go and, you know, call him and go to some of these courses and go from there. So you need a headshot, you need a, a resume, you need to film yourself doing all these skills and show us that you can do them. And he said, you know, but you're probably just wasting your time. I said, all right, thank you. Walked away, made a list, you know, like headshot, resume, call this guy. Like, and um, I did all those things. My first headshots I've kept because it's brilliant. I don't think I even brushed my hair. Um, I didn't have any makeup on. <laughs> so like, like, and I was like in these poses like, like this and like 
like power poses. <laughs> like, I don't know. I had no, no clue what I was getting into. And, and my early demo tapes were just me like spinning this long staff or like, snorkeling in a lake and you know I thought those would be the really cool things that would get me there um and you know I have to say the second stunt day I ever did that guy was there working on that set and I took him a case of beer <laughs> I was like I don't know if you remember me but <laughs> I did everything you said and, and here I am today so um you know it was the hardest you can't even explain what a gap there was between the reality and the dream. Um, there were so many days where I just thought I'd bitten off more than I could chew. Um, you, like, you know, from this little girl in this mid North town with 200 people to, I'm going to be a, a stunt performer uh, in Hollywood was just massive massive gap and i had a million people who would tell me why it wasn't going to happen and very very few people who were going to tell me that it could happen so um you know that that self-belief had to be strong and getting up every morning and telling myself i could do it had to be strong but there were definitely weak days you know calling up my mom and be like, doop, 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 doop. like oh God, I don't think I can do this, you know? And mom would be like, well, come home. And then I'd like stick the chin out and be like, no, <laughs> and I'm coming home. <laughs> but um, it normally takes people five years from the time they decide to become a stunt performer to, to the time they um, achieve being a stunt performer. And I managed to become a full-time stunt performer in three years. So from the little bush scrubber to the, to doubling, you know, Jennifer Garner and Electra was three years. Nice. So it sounded like for a second time in your life, somebody told you that you couldn't do something. Um, what, what do you think it was that your first experience of doing something that you were told you couldn't do drove you on? Or like you said, that's, you, that's your characteristic, your, your chin out, I'm going to do this. And that's, that, and that's what, or, or was it a moment of you heard what you needed to hear and ignored the bit that you didn't? I think I actually, you know, one of the things I talk to people about is like, what do you do with the nose? You know, so especially with the society today, we get brought up with participation awards and everything, you know, everyone's equal and fair, like in a competition and things like that. So I find like you get to the stage where you don't know what to do with a no. You know, like no's just stop people in their tracks. And um, I think that it's what you do with the no's that is the most important thing in your life. Like how do you move forward? What lessons do you take from that? Where do you go with the no's? And um, that's what I think I learned well and what I think I do quite well is I never personalise the no's. Um, you know, somebody says to me, no, nah, that's not going to happen for you. I'm... I'm it actually motivates me, it like puts a fire in my belly and it doesn't, it doesn't make me turn around and walk away and, and it doesn't, um, I mean, there's definitely times where at the moment they say no, you're like, what, why me, why did that happen? But, you know, but it doesn't take me long to turn it around and be like, well, next time you're going to be the one that says yes, you know, like, and, and what do I need to do that next time that no will be a yes. So I'll be the best person possible for that job or I, you know, I will get that job. But, you know, i got to be honest with you. The first time stunt job I booked, I couldn't even believe it. I was just, I was just like, <laughs> I remember calling up mum from Vancouver and just sobbing like, oh, I did it, I did it. You know, I was like, I didn't know it would be a three-year dream I thought it would be as simple as being like, oh, we're a stunt performer and stepping right into that job. Um, I didn't know stunts would hurt. I had no clue. I thought there was like this little bit of powder and magic dust that people put on it and, and it was all smoke and mirrors and it's, and it's not. You know, I didn't know the hard work that would have to go into it. Um, and so to work through all of those no's and finally get that yes was just the most incredible moment of my life you know wicked um 
I often tell people that I'm going to own a deer farm and it's hard enough when people ask me what I do and I say I'm not too interested and they go okay <laughs> and, and, they, and, and, and why do you want to do that and I said I like him you know helping people and improving their life and then oh yeah is, is that what you you know that you're dreaming is oh yeah no, I want to own a deer farm and then they're just like what what's going on um yeah how how important do you think it is to constantly tell yourself your dream like, you know you say every day it's, it's a it's a because to remind this is my dream this is why i'm doing this but every day you know every single day i do something that moves me towards my dream and it can be as small as an email or a phone call or it can be as big as sitting down all day and writing my next book which is something i have to do soon but you know like every, it, you have to have such good habits that it becomes ingrained in who you are to be constantly moving towards these dreams and goals, you know? Yeah. It's so important to tell yourself you can do it. And the days that you don't believe it's so important to have someone who will tell you that you can do it too. And I always tell people to surround themselves with people that are the, you know, are the people that will tell you when you don't believe it yourself. And that's really hard to find. Um, you know, especially when you have big dreams and especially when they seem impossible. I was big, like I was muscly. You could imagine a rock climbing guide, like and my like legs were as thick as my waist and and I was I didn't have any transferable skills and I was the age that most people retire from stunts. You know, so to find anybody apart from me that was going to be able to say, oh, I could do it, oh, I could become a stunt performer, was damn near impossible, you know. But as I said, I had mum and dad that just said, if you believe it, you will be able to make it happen. And then I knew also that if I didn't make it happen, there would be no judgment. You know, they would be my safety now. I could, I could leap because I knew if I fell, mum and dad would just be like it's okay like where do we go to now from here no nice. so, yeah uh, i um a sort of a thought i've sort of come to of late is that my telling people what i wanted to do i aimed too low growing up um from 12 really? years old, i said oh, i'm going to be an optometrist and then i got to be an optometrist and i was kind of like oh it was <laughs> that's all i had to do you know yeah. <laughs> needless, needless to say it was you know high school and then seven years of university but all the same you sort of got there and you're like right so i am that now well what, what else what else could i be what else could i do and and it's amazing like you say those everyday things and you know um i read stuff all the time and, and you know always keep up with what's going on i just i just want to be ready and and that was one of the things that that we had on one of our other podcasts with talman who's a photographer you see that it's the opportunities when that when you're prepared, that that creates success, and, and, and you're and you're there to go. Um, the guy said to you, "What are you the best in the world at?" And then you became the best in the world at stunt performing. What, what, what's what's the tourist award? And, and tell us about it. What is what is it like? I said the Oscars of, of stunt being a stunt performer. <laughs> yeah. So when I dreamed of being a stunt performer, my goal was to be the lead double of. Uh, the, you know, I was always playing superheroes as a kid. You know, when you go to the, I think of shows at in New Zealand, like the Royal Show, and you get show bags and you go on like Ferris wheels and rides and stuff like that. Um, we we have an Easter show in Auckland, and yeah, I I remember when I was when I was young, my grandparents went to Expo Oz, so I knew about expos. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's. Well, these, these royal shows, you'd get to choose, like, you'd get show bags. And so they'd be themed show bags. So you could get, like, the Hubba Bubba bag and you'd get, like, all sorts of chewing gum in it. Or you'd get the Lifesavers bag. Or you could get, like, the superhero bags. So I was only allowed two show bags. And I would always get, like, the one that had the most lollies in it. So it was, like, Lifesaver bag or something like that. And then I'd get a superhero bag. So I would get the Batgirl bag. And you would get, like plastic belt and you would get like a Batgirl mask and a cape and you know I'd like strut around in my knickers with all the like stuff on it <laughs> like yeah I'm a superhero so my goal when I got into stunts was like to be to do all the stunts for a superhero for the whole for a big action movie I knew of the Taurus Awards because um 
the stunt performers don't get acknowledged in the Oscars and we don't, we don't get acknowledged anywhere. And it's quite fascinating in this day and age now um, because, you know, hair and makeup get acknowledged and sound get acknowledged and special effects get acknowledged. And, you know, the stunt performers that are on screen and that are making these massive action sequences that are getting all the accolades that happen, um, everybody just wants to believe that the actors are still doing them all themselves. So we don't have any acknowledgement of the best in our industry. So Red Bull and funny enough, I think it was like The Rock or somebody like Jason Statham was really good with it. They came, like they petitioned for us to have our own award ceremony. And so uh, we got the Taurus World Stunt Awards sponsored by Red Bull. And it's, um, I think it's been going for like 13 years or something where the best of the best in our industry get voted on by all the peers around the world and um, get you know, we get a Taurus Stunt Award at the end of it. So it is our Oscars and it's our, our accolade for doing a good job. Um, and I never dreamed that big. Just never even crossed my mind that that, that would even be a possibility. And um, I did this very cool stunt sequence on Thor. And up until probably the recent TV show that I did, it was probably the work I was most proud of. And I got to be a superhero for the entire movie. I did all Lady Sith stunts and I got to wear armor and swing swords and have shields and like, it was cool. And um, Lady Sith had the most action apart from Thor in, in the movie. And that was rare because back, you know, we've got Black Widow and all these really cool fighting chicks now, but back then it was a very rare thing to have that much action for a female. And so I got to play Lady Sif and it was, you know, seven months of one of the best jobs I've ever had. It was brilliant and fighting mainly that. So that, that was the way I got in. You could get in gymnastics or fighting. And I knew that at 26, there was no way I was going to be a world level gymnast. So I learned to fight. And um, I did call the guy that, that the number I got given and he became my mentor and he trained me almost every day. And when I didn't chop enough wood and I couldn't afford to pay for his classes, he, cause I didn't have a work visa over there for Canada yet. And he um, taught me free and because he wanted me to learn and he was excited by my passion for it, you know, and um, that's another little story in the whole thing. But part of um, the things that I do for people is because of people like him, you know, I can never ever pay Kirk back for training me and for taking that time and you know and believing in me so anytime anyone asks me for help or asks me to do something and you know perhaps they don't have the money to be able to pay or whatever I'm like doesn't matter you know <laughs> like I have this massive universal debt and I'm just gonna be like what do you need um, now I'm gonna have everyone calling me up aren't I <laughs> Damn it, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see, we'll see your, your uh, contacts at the end. But, um, <laughs> Damn it. Might have changed. <laughs> it's too late to, to take that back, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so I got to do this for Lady Sif and I had a massive action sequence and it got nominated for a World Tourist Stunt Award. And I remember being told that I got the nomination and I just sort of, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to go because I won't win. You know, and that's just embarrassing when you're in the crowd and they don't call out your name. And then at the last second, I was like, ah, oh, you know what? It doesn't matter who wins. Like being nominated is, is just the incredible thing and supporting. I was nominated for the best female stunt performer in the world that year. Um, and, you know, you got to support everybody who who even is there and doing that so I ended up going along and you know you're sitting there in the crowd and you're watching everything and then all of a sudden they're like you know and the winner is Kai Frenot and I have like this video that my friend was filming at the time and I, you hear me go <laughs> and then I wander up and it was the most emotional moment of my life you know just being being told that you'd never be physically active again and then 
winning the biggest award you can win in probably arguably one of the most physical careers in the world um, just was beyond anything. I'm, I'm even getting chills now, you know, <laughs> just even remembering that moment. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, they try to hand me the award and it's this massive like meter and a half high statue and, and they try and hand it to me and I'm like, no, <laughs> like I don't even take it. <laughs> I just feel like, so blown away by the whole moment and um yeah it was very emotional and and very amazing and just just I don't know beyond anything I could have dreamed I guess yeah and so how did that make you feel did you did you feel justified did you feel pride did you feel shock what what was what was the feelings um definitely shocked and uh, you know, a disbelief and yeah, just, I don't know, in awe of the whole process. And I, I still don't believe it now to this day. I think that's one of those things my brain's just disconnected from. So even trying to associate feelings to it is just like, well, that was something that happened to someone else. I mean, I know I've got the trophy at home, but that's just, <laughs> I don't know how that happened, you know? So um, yeah, it probably made me more humbled than anything that I'd, I'd done that. And then, um, you know, and I sold my book off the back of it. So that was, that was probably the most exciting thing for me apart from, apart from winning it. I was like, uh, Penguin bought my book, um, because of that award. So it had a few knock on effects as well. Nice. Before, before we touch on the book, I might have my links wrong here, but mm -hmm. You said that um, you got the superhero bag and you, and you were going around as Batwoman. Um, am I correct that Sharon Stone was Catwoman and you got to work for her? Is that right? Is that a right? Oh, <laughs> Halle Berry was Catwoman. Oh, yeah. So Sharon Stone's not a Catwoman. No, she was in Catwoman. She was the evil nemesis, you know? Right. So I got to fight Catwoman. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really cool. And then I was like almost Wonder Woman too. Like they had a, initially they had like a just, that would have been the highlight of my career to be Wonder Woman. But they had like a Justice League that was floating around about five years ago and um, they cast an Australian lady, Megan Gale, as Wonder Woman and they'd booked me in to double her and then it all fell apart. But that would have been the, the, the absolute highlight would be uh, Wonder Woman. But yeah. No, that, that's awesome. So we'll carry on with the book. and <laughs> and. Did, am I right? It's got two names in the book? Um, yes. So it's got one in America um, yeah. and one in Australia. So it was published by Bear Grylls's, the same company that publishes Bear Grylls's books in America and then by Penguin in Australia. So it does look like I'm, I've got quite a resume of books, but I really only have one. Yeah. And so what's the premise for the book? Well, I was w reading a Dilbert cartoon. Do you know Dilbert? It's like that office -y, nerdy dude and it's just this cartoon and Dilbert was saying to a, um, to a lady like, oh, you know, when the end of the world comes, I've got shares in gold and I've got all this water bottles in my basement. I have all these protein bars. And he says, well, what are you going to do when the world ends? And she says, well, I have your address. And so I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, really? we're still there, huh? You know, we still think that when the world ends, the women are going to need to run to the nearest man. So I was a bit like, Ooh, you know, and, and I'm, you know, like I'm not a rabid feminist or anything like that. I believe that women are amazing and I believe men should be men. You know, I believe this, this movement towards the men reclaiming their masculinity and everything is the best thing that could ever happen for men. And, you know, I believe, mm -mm, but I, I also believe that women have this amazing quality to them that, that they are powerful and they are feminine at the same time. And so I sat down and wanted to write a survival book for women to say, you know what, you know, we're brilliant, we're amazing. And, and it ended up just being a survival book that could be for anybody really. But um, I just talk about using attitudes of survival to get you through everyday situations. So that's sort of the main premise of the book in the end. And, and I love that the penguin one here has got like this bright pink cover and like just these really cool things on it. But at the end of the day, anyone who read it would, you know, possibly, I mean, it's 95% for everyone. And then 
five percent if you want to run in high heels you know there's a few hints on that stuff <laughs> nice and i suppose that um skills on the job is it running in high heels definitely learnt that on the job you yeah. know going from a uh, from an outdoor guide who had never worn high heels to actually having to fight in high heels that was one of my bigger challenges that's for sure Deadly. Um, the, you said your second thing you're most proud of is your TV show. Is, is that um, walking through this Sierra Nevada or something? Oh, no, no. It was um, oh, for stunts. So, um, you know, I, w- I finished my career doing a TV show called Blind Spot. And it wasn't really big in Australia, or probably not in New Zealand either, but I, it was quite a big show in America and all around the world, really. And it's like a lady covered in tattoos comes out of a bag in Times Square and um, turns out every tattoo on her body relates to sort of a crime of the week. And um, I was the girl that I doubled on Thor. Um, I doubled her for 10 years, um, Jamie Alexander. And I got to do some of the best fighting of my career on that show. She was meant to be the only female Navy SEAL in existence. So, you know, just the coolest stunts, the best fighting I've ever done. I was the fittest I'd ever been in my life, Um, you know, and after 16 years of stunts, it was, you know, it was brilliant to sort of end the career on the best stuff I've probably ever done, apart from some of the cool stuff on Thor. Awesome. So what's the preparation like for something like that to, be become a navy seal basically well you get trained by navy seals which is really cool (laughs) (laughs) fantastic yeah so i mean i love jamie um we we work together a lot but when she got the call for the job they're like you know you're going to be a navy seal and she's like great great and like can you swim and she's like yeah yeah i love swimming cool you've got the job you know she calls me up she's like I've told them I can swim and I can't swim <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, I've got this great photo of me like literally holding her up in the pool while she's learning how to do over arm <laughs> um, you know so that was part of my preparation with her was swimming lessons um but for you know for me we did a lot of weapons training which was really cool we got um got trained by this guy who literally was on speed dial to Obama. He, he was the type of guy that, you know, you'd say, Oh, you know, this person's really bothering me. You need me to fix that? No, (laughs) no, I don't need you to fix that. (laughs) But I know that I now have someone on speed dial that if anywhere in the world, I got into trouble, I would just need to text him and like shit would go down. (laughs) Yeah, someone with a certain selective uh, set of skills, you might say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that was a hilarious thing too. So we were being trained in these weapons and for some reason we couldn't find a space that we were allowed to be trained in. So we were doing it in, in his hotel room in New York City. So we were, you know, we're creeping around the room and we're learning how to clear a room and how to like, like recop these weapons in really cool ways and then, And then Jamie and I go into the bathroom to change for the Navy SEAL part of it, where we're going to do breath holds and things like that. And suddenly there's like this bang on the bathroom door, like bang, bang, bang. And I'm sort of open it because I was changed. And there's this lady with a gun and like a police lady. And she's like, show me your hands. And I was like, ah, she's like, what agency are you with? And I thought she meant like talent agency. So I'm like, Gersh, you know, like, which is a big talent agency in Los Angeles. (laughs) And she's just like, what? And what had happened was a window cleaner on the building, like opposite had seen us with the guns and reported to police and they'd locked down like the whole city block and had like evacuated people from the hotel. And if you see something, say something, you know, it was like, uh, yeah. But then obviously this, this guy that was training us just flashes his ID and everyone's like, sorry, sir. Okay, sir. Absolutely, sir. And the, and the room clears out and we're just left there going. <laughs> I was going to say someone, someone forgot to hand a memo, but by the sounds of things, you don't need a memo when you've, when you've got him on your team. <laughs> and you got Cass in there. It's like, not so good. <laughs> so that was some of the prep we did for it. Nice. Um, so when we were, Speaking today in preparation for the show, you said about um, no, I can't even say the word hemo. Oh, a hemochromatosis. Hemochromatosis. Yes. Yeah. Is it that's too much iron? Am I right? 
Yeah, so yeah. Um, it's a genetic anomaly that I've only just learnt was a result of the Vikings. So whereas before I was like, ah, that hemochromatosis, now I'm like, means I'm part Viking, you know. <laughs> but um, it means that you take too much iron out of food. So you're meant to give blood if, mm. um, like once or twice a week to keep the iron balance. And normally it flares up in your 40s, but it flared up for me in my early 20s um so i basically was vego for 22 years because i couldn't be bothered donating blood um and i was healthiest that way um i didn't you know er everyone's getting anemia and i was just you know the little bit from veggies and things like that was all i really needed so um yeah and but even spinach was starting to make so i turned yellow and then I get really tired and fatigued. And a lot of it you get like yellow. It looks like I'm back in the 70s or whatever, the 80s with the yellow eyeshadow up here and my hands would be very yellow and I'd start to get nosebleeds if I had too much iron in my blood. So it was something that was probably getting worse as I got older. Um, but, yeah, I was managing it. Yeah, and so you said that now you've, you've switched away from vegetarian. Yeah. How, how is... How has that one affected that condition and two, why, what, what motivated you to start taking, having meat again? So I, I realized one of the challenges as a female stunt performer is being as skinny as the actresses are, but being strong enough to not break when you hit something. So that's, that's one of the biggest challenges you'll face. Um, the actresses are getting a little bit healthier, but they were definitely on the cigarettes and coffee diet a lot when um, I first started doubling them and they got so skinny, like maybe 10 years ago. And I would talk to some of these girls and I'd be like, I can't, like, if you want me to double you, you need to eat. Like, I cannot double you like this. Um, I mean, I still would with some of them, but it would look ridiculous. You know, I'd be two sizes bigger in jeans and a lot of it's what you look like from behind and they were skinny and, you know, the hair was falling out and they were super unhealthy. But the challenge for me was to be as skinny as possible, but strong. And so over the years, I sort of developed eating habits that kept me healthy. And as you know, as you you know, the first thing you take out is gluten and then, and then sugar. And then um, for me, I was still having a little bit of dairy, but then I sort of took all dairy out. And um, as a result of no sugar, no dairy, no gluten. Um, and then Adam and I were doing some traveling together and he's um, pure sort of paleo. And so he had vegetarian and paleo and he when he heard about the hemochromatosis, he did some research into it and there were some cases that suggested that hemochromatosis could be reversed through, um, through having no gluten, no sugar, no dairy. So even though I was already doing those things, I hadn't um, then dabbled back into eating meat again. So um, we were quite often out bush and, you know, you just really got meat and veggies and I was getting so hungry because <laughs> all I was eating was sort of like the sides of what we were cooking. And I decided to give meat a go because I hadn't given up meat because I didn't like it. Um, and I hadn't given up meat for ethical reasons. And I just really had to for health reasons. And um, so I started just adding a little bit of meat back in and seeing what happened in it. And then, you know, it turns out I actually, the yellow faded from having the meat, but having no gluten, dairy or sugar with it. And... Um, so I don't, I don't really say I'm paleo, but I do a really high good fats diet and I do, a, you know, I do meat now and vegetables and, and, you know, I heal so quickly and I'm so, I get strong super quickly. Um, Adam had it, <laughs> I don't know, we were training together for a challenge that I had coming up. Um, in i had in march i don't know march eight what are we march yeah had it in march and um we were training together and so i started wanting to put on some bulk and within two weeks i was jacked and <laughs> it was just it's like, how does that happen but i think it has a lot to do with with that diet just being so perfect for for 
you know, it was long, lean muscle, but it built quickly. And I have the pathways from, you know, from climbing and all that sort of thing anyway. But um, my body just really responds well to it now. And I don't get the nosebleeds and I'm not yellow. And it's fascinating to me. It seems like it's really turned the hemochromatosis around. So huge advocate. Lovely. Um, so, Kai, where, where, I'll let you get back to writing your book. Where can, where can people find you? <laughs> Um, you can find me on Insta and Facebook and Twitter and it's Kai Freno, which is, um, just K Y and then F U R N E A U X. Um, my website's Kai Freno.com and please like anyone reach out, you know, I mean, I'm always happy to hear people's stories and I'm always happy to have a chat and, um, yeah, any, anything you need, just hit me up. If I've got time, I'll, I'll help you out. Lovely. And, um, what what's something that you'd like to leave people with? Uh, you, you said you'd love to give people to acknowledge fear and, and, and take it on. I think that, that people feel isolated by fear. You know, like there's all this anxiety and, and depression and everything going around these days. And part of what I think um, exasperates it is um, believing that it's only happening to you. Um, so I would... I mean, it's such a bigger topic, <laughs> but I would just encourage people to know that when they are feeling fearful, everybody feels fearful. And when um, they're wondering what to do with that fear, don't let that fear be the thing that stops you from doing anything. Like, let it be the motivator. Like, if it feels uncomfortable, do it, you know? Like, if... if um, if it takes your breath away a little bit or makes you a bit nervous, like push that comfort zone. Um, know that fear is like a, 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 like sort of, it's not fear. It's like bravery is like a muscle. You know, if you flex it in the smallest of situations, like if you get nervous standing up in front of people and speaking, like the more you do it, the more you flex that muscle, the easier it's going to become and, and the fear will sort of move away. And, um, and that then can transfer into every aspect of your life. But don't let fear be the thing that stops you from doing anything. And one of the things I do with fear is you will start to notice that if, have you seen that movie Inside Out where all the little emotions are little different characters and stuff? I know, I know about it. No, I haven't watched it. But yeah, I know about like, it. If you start to listen, you'll hear that fear is a voice in your head. And if you can disassociate it, with it enough to give it its own character and just know that that voice isn't who you are on the inside. That's just a part of, of what's going on in your mind. And so I just sort of listen and acknowledge it. Like, of course, yes, I'm going backwards off a cliff right now. You know, yes, I know that's a really stupid thing to do. You know, like, yes, I know falling off this building is probably, you know, not usually good for my survival, but you know, you acknowledge the fear, but, know that in a situation, fear is never going to make that situation better. Mm. So if you can acknowledge it but move it somewhere else for now, um, then that's the best way of dealing with it. Like I don't believe that you're going to have a very positive income, uh, positive income, positive outcome if you let fear rule you when you move through anything that's happening for you. Um, so if you can, if you can listen to it, acknowledge it, move it away and do it anyway, I feel like it's just a, a way better outcome. So that was like a long thing about fear. <laughs> no, it's, it's fantastic. And, I guess, it's, yeah, I guess the thing I'd like to leave people with is like that they are far more than they ever believe, you know, like, yes, there's a lot of people that are willing to put limitations on you, but sometimes the biggest person that limits what you can do is yourself. And so just know that you are far more than you even believe you are. So why not try? Why not push it? Why not see just how incredible you can really be? You know, that's probably the, the thing I would leave people with. Fantastic. And that's why it's been so cool having you on the podcast, Kai, because that's uh, personifies what we're all about. Uh, so thank you so much. And um, we'll have your links in the show notes. And um, yeah, once again, thank you so much for coming on board. Thanks for getting in touch with me. And it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's been lovely chatting with you. Cheers. Bye-bye.